Hi, Mike Kennedy, Water Connection. All tank type water heaters manufactured in the United States come with anode rods. Those anodes are made of magnesium, which is the preferred metal to protect the inside of a water heater, or aluminum or aluminum zinc. Those anodes are in place to sacrifice their metal so that the tank doesn't sacrifice it. Now, the purpose of that anode is to protect the exposed steel. Now, you're probably asking, oh, aren't water heaters protected on the inside with a lining? Well, yes, they are. They put on a lining at the factory. It's a glass lining. It looks like paint when they apply it, but when they bake it on, it looks more like a glass finish. They call it vitreous enamel. Now, it can have voids in the manufacturing process, which can expose some of that steel. So the anode is an important part of that water heater, which will protect the manufacturer's warranty and will protect your product, hopefully through the warranty. Now, certain conditions can cause that steel to be more exposed. For instance, in the transportation of that water heater from state to state to state, it can crack the lining even more, exposing more steel. The other thing that can happen is if you are on city water and you have fluctuating pressures that are constant, or when your water heater in all cases is heating up, it increases the pressure and it bellows back and forth. That bellowing causes that glass lining to crack. Now, if you have constant pressure, maybe in well water, where you have well water, it may not be a concern with fluctuating pressure. Yet well water has its other concerns, and that is that if it's in low in pH, meaning it's acidic, or you're using a salt-based water softener to treat your water, that condition, that water condition, will consume that anode much quicker. So, what do you do? The frequency of change out on these anodes depends on water usage. It depends on the condition of your water. It depends on the temperature that you keep that water at, which can excite the electrons more. So you want to check those anodes periodically. And what an anode looks like is it looks like this. They come in a couple of different styles. One has a outlet attached to an inlet. So the inlet allows water to come in from the water heater and move out to your house on the hot side of the tank. These are common. These are hex head anodes. And I would say that probably 70% of the tanks have these installed. And most manufacturers put in a magnesium anode because magnesium protects the tank better it corrodes quicker to protect the steel from corroding. Yet, in certain conditions, you may want to go to an aluminum or aluminum zinc rod, which has a higher resistance value built into it. It's a little bit lower on the galvanic corrosion chart, and it will give you a little better life. Now, if you have a salt-based water softener, check. Check the hardness on your uh, water softener. Go to a Leslie's pool supply and take a sample of water and find out what your hardness is. Make sure that you're using the correct hardness setting on your softener so that you're not introducing more salt into solution. Uh, that can not only increase your salt use,
because of the regeneration that's going on, but it can also increase the electrolysis, which will eat up the anodes quicker. Um, so those are the other things. The other thing I did not show you is that all of these, the style of anodes that I showed you also come in a link. So if you have a low ceiling height, you can drop this in and that will allow you to work within a short space. Um, the other thing is if, um, and, and the other thing uh, is the fluctuation problem where you get the, the fluctuation in pressure. I always recommend that you put in an expansion tank. It could be anywhere on the supply line to the water heater. Um, but install an expansion tank and set the pressure to the pressure that you have at your house. And you can take a gauge. Um, they're not expensive. You can buy a gauge that you screw on your uh, hose bib or on the bottom of your water heater, and that will tell you what pressure you have. Um, and put an expansion tank in. That has a bladder in it. When that tank expands when it's heating, that bladder takes up that expansion, not the water heater. So that will help give you some additional life other than checking the anodes frequently, um, especially if you're in adverse water conditions, check those anodes at the end of the first year and then check them for frequency so that you know exactly when to change the anodes out so that you keep them intact. For instance, that's an anode that is totally consumed. Now that's going to tell you that that water heater most likely is getting eaten at the metal. This is an anode that is about half consumed, and that's about time to change it. It's still operating, it's still doing its job, yet it's at that point when you get about half the rod eaten, or six inches of core wire showing at the top and showing at the bottom, it's time to replace that anode. Now, the Anodes that I showed you are available in magnesium, aluminum, aluminum, zinc. The other style anode that's becoming very popular is a powered anode. The powered anode works with a electrode made of titanium. It's non-corrosive, so it doesn't matter what the water conditions are. It will continue to work as long as there's power to this plug. And on this plug, there's an indicator light. The other thing that a powered anode will do is if you're on well water and you're experiencing a rotten egg smell, that rotten egg smell is created by the anode that's in your water heater and the addition of a water softener which is eating that anode or your water condition, which is eating that anode quicker and that anode is outgassing. If you're experiencing gas coming out of your hot tap, that tells me that your anode is being consumed at a very quick rate. And the way to correct that is to go to an aluminum zinc rod, which has a higher resistance level in it, or put in a powered anode. This will replace the hex head anode. And there is an adapter that the manufacturer makes. It's a pretty clever adapter, actually that adapts to the hot side. So this will replace the hot nipple and it'll replace the hex head. And it's short enough that it will go in most spaces um, that are required. Now, the other thing um, that I wanted to talk about was the fact that 
if you're on hard water, hard water produces scale. So the other thing that you want to do is you want to flush that water heater. And you want a good flushing valve to do that with. Um, because the scale, especially on a gas heater, that scale sitting at the bottom of that water heater is a barrier between the gas flame and the water you're heating. And what it does is it superheats that bottom and that glass lining can melt and that exposes the steel even more and causes the anode to work even harder. The other thing that can make your anode work hard is stray current. So check and make sure that your main water line coming into the house, if it's metal, and that metal is buried in the ground from the meter to your house, make sure that you ground that main coal water line. And then you would come over to your water heater and if your gas line, especially on a gas water, not so much electric, but gas water heater, that gas line is also metal coming from the street to the house. You want to bond with a number six wire with a bonding clamp from the gas line up to the hot line and then back over. That will move the straight current from the gas line to the hot, back over to the cold, and back to ground. So there's some things to keep in mind. Look at your situation. You may find that, the, that you need to do some of these things in order to correct the expansion tank. Look for stray current. Make sure you've got a good flush valve. And when I say good flush valve, a valve like this that has a full port on it, uh, one with a cap, it's got a quarter turn, and that will allow you to get a flush through the bottom of that water heater. We do have a tape on um, a superior flush system, or I think it's actually called superior flush system device on YouTube, you might want to look at that. That is on a dip tube that we developed that goes inside the water heater and swirls the scale up and out. So by having a way to flush the heater really well, make sure that you keep the pressure in, 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 in check, make sure the electrical is straight away from the tank, and check the anodes periodically to figure out exactly what that sequence is of timing to change them out. And you'll have a water heater that'll last you three to four times the normal life. How do I know that? I've been doing this for 36 years and I've worked on 2,600 water heaters. I had a complex with 78 water heaters on it. I worked on that for 30 years and I only had one water heater go bad in those 30 years. When I started on those water heaters, they were five years old and they eventually changed them out just for the simple reason that they wanted to update them. But for 35 years, we kept those going. Now, I'm gonna take a break. We're gonna be back. I'm going to set up my tools. I'm going to show you how to change out the anodes. And I'm going to show you just a couple little tricks to make your job a little bit easier. Stay tuned. We'll be back in just a minute. Thank you. Hi again. Before we get started, let's just go over a couple of things. I want to make sure that you order the right anode for the right condition and for your tank. So, to reiterate, let's just discuss what we've already done. And that is, if you have a water softener, best rod would be an aluminum zinc rod or a powered anode. That's going to give you the best service life. The aluminum zinc rod you'll have to check periodically, uh, maybe every 
two to four years. Um, although, uh, if you have a water softener, you might consider changing over to uh, potassium chloride instead of salt. Uh, the potassium does not set up the electrolysis charge that salt does as much. Although, just in my, my own travels working on water eaters, I find that you can generally get another year or two uh, out of a magnesium anode when a person is using potassium. So consider potassium instead of salt pellets. Um, the other thing, if you're on well water and that well water pH is somewhere between six and eight, you don't have a water softener, then I would recommend that you put in a magnesium anode. If your water pH is low, meaning it's acidic, then I would go again to an aluminum zinc rod or a powered anode. Um, if you're on city water, which is treated, um, a magnesium anode will work well, even if the water has hardness in it. It'll give you good life expectancy generally don't need to change it out or check it, but every three to five years. Um, if you want the ultimate fix, obviously you would go to a powered anode, but be aware you have to have a plug somewhere close to the water heater as I do, or you can run an extension cord. Uh, if you're living in a cabin uh, or say vacationing in a cabin that's closed down for part of the year, or you have a vacation home that you close down and you shut off the power, then the powered anode won't work, but the aluminum zinc rod would work in that situation. And you can do uh, a, the one thing with it, and that is you can put a valve on it. So for instance, if you replaced the existing hex head anode, which looks like that. And you put in this flexible, which is universal. So it ships this way. And you had a funnel. So every time you start up your cabin or your vacation home, you'd simply add the funnel and put in a quart of hydrogen peroxide to treat the tank. Um, those treatment directions are on our site, waterconnection.com, and you can see that. You can also see this product that um, has a valve attached to it, <coughs> and excuse me, it goes on the hex, and we also have one that goes on the outlet side of the tank. Check your ceiling height. Make sure that you have enough ceiling height if you'd like to put a solid anode in. Uh, the ones with the nipples are about 48 inches. Uh, and these are pretty standard in the industry. The one with the hex head is 44 inches. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you at least have that height position between the top of the tank and the ceiling. If you don't, then you go to the uh, one that has the uh, separate links so that you can drop each link in. Um, the other thing is you will find on electric water heaters um, that were manufactured uh, April of 2015 and to present day, some of those water heaters have, uh, have to meet certain energy standards so they over insulate the electric heaters and some of them have anywhere from three to four inches of insulation. So if you have an outlet anode and most outlet anodes, there's one manufacturer that from their 10 gallon up to their 75 gallon, they put nothing but an outlet anode in, which is the anode that has a nipple. That extra tank insulation, you will want to buy a, a outlet anode with a longer nipple. They generally come in five or six inch. 
How do you know if you have insulation that's thick? Just take a thin screwdriver and just drop it in next to the pipe nipple, either on the cold or hot, or even where the anode is located. And that will tell you what that depth of insulation is so you know what type of anode to buy. Um, again, location of anode and style. What type of anode do you need? You need to find the anode before you order. Is it a hex head? Is it an outlet? There is some AO Smith, some more flow water heaters that are designed with an outlet anode. So you have to be careful. Look for a two inch diameter disc, usually that comes in, uh, not to the center on an electric heater, but on a gas, it could come in close to the center, uh, close to the flue pipe, generally in two or three inches, uh, either from the back side or the front side. It could be even close to the nipple. But look for a two inch disc, usually plastic, or it may just be um, a foam insulation two inch diameter. And you can dig down with a flat head screwdriver and you'll find the hex, the six sided. That'll tell you that you have a hex head. If you don't see that disc anywhere located on that water heater, then you have an outlet anode. And the way that you know that is if you disconnect your connection and drop a screwdriver in, that screwdriver will have a stop point. See, it has a stop point. Now, the other thing is when you order an anode, especially the outlet style anode, you see this is the anode that we supply. It has a formed end, plastic end. Why is that important? That's important because we don't want water moving from the water heater through the, between the plastic and the metal before it comes out to supply your house. That creates rust. And you can see this does not have a formed end. And you can see the rust that's developing here. That's a poor design. So look for this type of anode. We're not the only supplier of it, but look for that formed end on there. That's important. Now, the other thing to consider is manufacturers know the importance of anodes. So what do they do on a six year warranted water heater? They put one anode in. On a 12 year warranted water heater and they add a secondary anode or they put a larger anode in. And that gives them that longer protection period to get them through that warranty service. Um, and they charge a lot more money for it when the anode is actually fairly reasonable. I mean, you can buy these anodes um, anywhere from $35 up to $50, depending on the style and the type of anode. Now, if you want to know just a simple little trick as to do you need an anode, just take a draw of water off the bottom of your drain valve, and that will tell you the rust. If you pull rust, you've got a problem with your anode. That anode is most likely at this point, which means your tank is now rusting out. Does that mean you should get rid of your tank? Not necessarily. I've worked on a lot of water heaters. I had a lot of rust in them. I dropped an anode in them and some of them lasted 10 years plus. Some of them lasted two more years. But generally what happens when you drop that anode in, even on a rod that was like this, it stops any further rusting inside that water heater. So that's the benefit of doing this service. Now, if you have an electric water heater, go out to the panel or go to your breaker at the water heater, shut it off shut the water supply off, 
to the water heater. On a gas heater, simply turn to pilot. We're only going to draw down a certain amount of water uh, just so that we don't have water in these pipes. So I'm going to take a bucket, for instance. I'm now going to draw water off the water here until that pressure dissipates. So I've just got a drip. Now I might have to do that again. I don't know uh, because I may have a valve leaking. Uh, I may have a faucet in the house leaking that allows air to move through here and, 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 and move um, uh, water through these pipes. So I may have, if it's filling up again, I may have to do something about that. Um, the one thing um, I wanted to go through, oh, okay, so we can do that. Um, now, take a wrench, and generally, these are great. These are plumber pumps. I prefer these over everything else. Now I'm going to take the connectors apart because I want a clear area to work with. On a gas heater, take the flue connection off, disconnect your connectors, and I hope you're, you have flex connectors. If you don't, I highly recommend them. If you've seen any of my tapes, you'll see that if you have rigid plumbing, either in copper or in CPVC, you can buy these adapters. One glues on, the other one is a shark bite fitting. It pushes on. <clears throat> so it makes it simple to change over to a flex connector. Why do you want to put flex connectors in? because it's easy to get back into your tank to service it or replace it. But look at that. I can tie that thing in a knot. The other thing is, if you look here, six inches up, six inches down, six inches up, superior heat trap to anything that you can buy on the market. So let's get this show on the road here. I'm going to show you how to remove these anodes and show you a couple little tricks. I'm going to show you how to double up on your anodes too because, um, for instance, if you have a Bradford White tank, and Bradford White, we know, they put an anode on this side of the tank. This is the hot outlet. Now, we're going to remove this first on the hot outlet. And I'm going to put a stiffener in. And that stiffener, and what I want to do is I want to bring this camera shot in so we can get a little more. Okay, there we go. Get a little more up front, up close uh, camera shot. So I'm putting a stiffener. Now that's just a, a three inch or six inch, whatever you've got. Uh, ratchet extension, 12 inch. And drop it in there. Why? We want to make sure we don't collapse that nipple. I like this type of wrench because it has a side jaw on it, but any wrench, it could have a side, it could have an end jaw, it could have an offset jaw. It doesn't really matter, but I'm gonna put a breaker on it. Now, the other important thing is don't drain the tank. The tank needs the weight in there so you don't turn it. So we're gonna pull this. Now, once I've loosened it, I can come back with my pumps and that just makes it really easy because I'm closing, squeezing, opening to pick it up and get it out of there. And I can pull that out now. Now, 
if for some reason you've got a leak coming out of here or a leak coming out of here, get yourself a small nipple. It could be long, it doesn't matter. Put a cap on it. Just like, like that, cap. And then close this off. That way, you don't have water dripping all over the place while you're working on it. So that gives it... So that's just another little trick I learned. And if we wanted to double up, for instance, on a Bradford White tank, okay, you're removing that. This TPR, which is here to release pressure, and um, it operates on temperature and pressure. So if you get temperature, of course, te higher the temperature, the higher the pressure. At 150 PSI, these open. On a Bradford White, they're located on top. <clears throat> so you can pull that. Take a brass coupler like this with a TPR and simply install it on top of this anode. Now you've got two anodes in the system by replacing or using their existing with a coupler. Uh, you're simply pulling it, dropping the anode in, a brass coupler connected to a brass unit okay, will give you double the anode protection in that water heater. Now, keep in mind, if it's an electric water heater and there's an element going through the center, you can't do that. <clears throat> you cannot interrupt the service on that element with metal. So, be careful with that. Now, a little trick here. When you're dealing with these anodes, the plastic inlet right here, that plastic inlet will swell with heat, with age. It can swell up and it makes it very difficult to get that out of that water heater. So the trick is, now I've already got it set up where it'll come out. Okay, it can come out of there with no problem. But if one swells up, what you're going to do is you're going to put that cap on top of that nipple. You're now going to set your adjustable wrench. You'll need one of these with a 12-inch handle. And you're going to open it so it'll just grab the nipple underneath. See? Like right there. I want to be able to grab it just underneath there. And then I'm going to build up a little block so I can get up under it. This, the cheetah bar, and I'm going to apply leverage. So as I pull up, I will take my pumps, again, the tool of choice, and I will twist that nipple attached to that anode back and forth. So as I pull up, twist, 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 back and forth, and that will allow that anode to come out freely without too much problem. Now you may have to put an additional block under here to build it up a little more to get it out, but it shouldn't be that difficult. Now, once you get it out, and you don't want that to happen again, well, what you have to do, because there's just a little bit of overlay right below the threads that the manufacturer puts it in, and you need to cut that. Now, it's simple. You take a 7 8 hole saw, off-the-shelf hole saw, you then ream that out just below the thread. You'll, you'll hit it. I may see if I've got some in there. No, that one's clear. But then I'll take an extra bit 
other than the 7 8 this is a 29 30 seconds Dremel drill bit. And I'll drop that in. That's clear. So I probably already drilled this tank. But if you don't want that swelling to happen again, when you put the new anode in and it's in there for four or five years, 7 8 hole saw, and then this, especially if you're adding a secondary anode, you may have to do this procedure. Now, as far as putting in a powered anode on the hot side, this is a nifty little fitting, and I think I said that before, but this is forged so that you don't have to use a 90 or a nipple or another nipple here with a T, and that accepts this powered anode. Okay, so if you're going to this side, obviously, you need to install this. And I'm trying to do that with my left, and I'm right-handed. And then that will be uh, screwed down till it's tight. And of course, the power anode installed. And then you'll need to have a plug either close by or you'll need an extension cord. They do put a 12 foot extension on this, the manufacturer. This wire here, and I'll show you, one of them has a spade connector and that spade connector connects to the anode. This one has a hole in it and it connects to the side of the tank to pick up the ground. So what you have to do is you're going to connect here. You're then going to unscrew the screw from the tank. Uh, I'm just using S to speed up thing. But, and then take some sand cloth and sand paper and just sand that paint away from the edge of that tank so that you've got pure metal contact with the ground and then that'll give you a much better contact anyways you can you can see what's going on there and then without this fitting obviously this would simply replace the hex head so once you remove the hex head you're going to do the same thing now when you put teflon on these double wrap do not put five wraps of Teflon. You may lose the connection. The way you can tell if you still have a connection is that you take a continuity tester and you simply hit the continuity tester to the top of the anode. For instance, it's in the back here. And, oops, I got the... And then we'll hit the tank. You see... I don't know if you can see that light, but there's a light coming on there. Let me, and that'll tell you, okay, come on. You probably saw it. Anyways, that tells you you've got a good connection. That's thread to thread connection. That means you're picking up the ground and you're gonna get good reaction with that anode. Now, finally, the trick, you need the tools. That's the thing. This is what I bought off the shelf at Harbor Freight. $25 for a three-quarter drive. One and one-sixteenth. That's a six-point socket. Do not use a 12-point socket. You will strip that anode and you won't be able to get it out. The only way you can get it out is you have to drill a hole through it. You have to put an easy out in it and try to get it out that way. And it's either that or you got to collapse the threads into each other to save the tank. So six point. Make sure you got a pretty good drive. I'm going to set it right there for now. I'm going to put two caps. Whoops. Let's put the anode back in. Oh, when you do put an anode back in, a new one, of course, we're going to replace. I want you to sand down the new anode and get the oxidation off of it. Why? 
it's going to give you better reaction time. I'm going to drop that in. I'm going to screw it down. Obviously, Teflon tape again. And one of my other little tricks to make it easy to get it out so it doesn't lock down under heat and age is put a little bit of the paste over the two wraps of Teflon that you're using. I'm going to put a couple caps here. And what are those caps for? Well, they are going to allow me to come in here with this 30 inch bar and whatever's comfortable, right? I want to reverse force. I want to be pulling so the tank doesn't turn the way that the anode comes out, which is counterclockwise. So I'm going to get my six point socket on there. I'm now going to pull both ways. So that way I can remove it. And there you go. You're going to come back. You're going to reconnect your connectors. You're going to turn the pressure back on. You're going to go in the house. Any displacement that you have, you're going to bleed the air out of a tap, a hot tap in the house. You're going to turn the electric heater back on and the gas and refire them up. Happy to have you here. Want you to save yours. So I'm glad you're watching these video presentations to get some ideas on how you can save yours. We want you back, so come back and see us again. And we love your comments, so leave us a comment. Appreciate you. Look out for more presentations because I got a lot more stuff coming. Thank you.